Welcome. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you all here. Um, my name is Navyo Gill. I'm a professor in the history department. Uh, today's event is titled A Crisis of Immigration, Gangs, Borders, and Social Justice, uh, and it features uh, Dr. David Brotherton. Um, today's event has been organized by the Gandhian Forum for Peace and Justice, of which I am merely the director. Uh, we have an incredible group of faculty, uh, staff, and students uh, who've worked together uh, to, bring to bring us all here to, to have this important discussion on this topic. Um, in that sense, the Gandhian Forum is living up to its mandate, which is to promote dialogue, analysis, and education on the most difficult questions of justice and peace in our world. Um, we're always open to new ideas and new members. So if you want to get involved, if you want to sort of share something or, or, or put something on, uh, please come see me after the talk or some of the other members of the executive board that are here. Um, before we get to our main speaker, I'd like to acknowledge our co-sponsors. Uh, it is a long list, but it reflects the support the Gandhian Forum has across campus. So we really appreciate uh, the Office of the Provost, uh, the Katsakos College of Business, the College of Education, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, the Departments of Africana World Studies, Anthropology, English, History, Political Science, Sociology, and Women's and Gender Studies, and the Asian Studies Program, and the Latin American and Latinx Studies Program. <clears throat> now, on to our speaker. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have Dr. Brotherton with us this morning. Uh, he is a professor of sociology at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, uh, where he also directs the Social Change and Transgressive Studies Project. Um, he's conducted extensive research uh, on a number of topics, uh, including street gangs, the politics of deportation, and social resistance in the U.S. and Latin America. Uh, he has an even longer list of publications. I'll, I'll just mention three in case people are interested. Um, Immigration Policy in the Age of Punishment, published this year. Um, Banished to the Homeland, Dominican Deportees and Their Stories of Exile from 2011, and The Almighty Latin King and Queen Nation, Street Politics and the Transformation of a New York City Gang uh, from 2004. Uh, today, uh, he is going to help us think through the historical and contemporary relationship between immigration, borders, and gang violence, as well as offer some insights into how we might meet the challenges of migration, equity, and justice in the 21st century. Uh, Dr. Brotherton will speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, and that'll leave us plenty of time for questions. So write down your questions, think about them, and we'll have a discussion afterwards. All yours. <coughs> OK. Does, um, is that what we come up now? Uh, yes. OK. Oh, great. <laughs> well, um, you'll come to see me. I mean, you sure you've got the right place? No, uh, so um, thanks very much for inviting me. It's a real privilege uh, to be here um, in your campus. I haven't been, never been here before. Um, and uh, to see so many young, young people uh, interested in a, a subject uh, which is uh, on the front burner uh, of the politics of this country. And it's um, something I've been involved in studying uh, for, for many years many years, uh, actually more than two decades, in various guises. Um, of course, I'm not from here. <laughs> I am an immigrant, um, and I come from there. <laughs> so in terms of the issues of borders, I've crossed many borders to get here. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I was born in that place uh, over 60 years ago. It's in the uh, East End of London, and um, I'm an eighth generation uh, Londoner uh, from the inner city. Um, I'm a, a Cockney, uh, which means I come from a certain part of uh, the metropolis, London, 
um, and I'm born within uh, to be a Cockney. You have to be born within the sound of uh, where bells were made in the 18th century called Bow Bells. And the um, definition of a Cockney is not a Londoner. It literally means somebody who is deviant. So I was born deviant. <laughs> I had no choice. I had to carry on my career as a deviant in order to live up to my, uh, I guess, my pathology. Um, so I, you know, when I was, you know, uh, another was kind enough to invite me here to talk about the borders. I, you know, I started to think about borders and, uh, you know, what they mean to me. And I'm going to give you a little spiel in a minute of how I uh, conceive of borders uh, in my work. And um, then I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, gangs. Um, you know, I've been uh, working with gangs since um, 1991, uh, whatever, how many, 20 something years, 27 years. Um, I, I started in San Francisco. California. I did my early work in uh, UC Santa Barbara and then UC Berkeley. And I was a high school teacher in San Francisco, uh, Mission High School. Uh, and um, it was, uh, uh, you know, only well, black, Latino and Asian, like my two whites out of about 1,500 kids. And I was a social studies teacher, an economics teacher, and in the late 80s. And... Um, uh, you know, I was, because I came from a sort of similar background as a lot of my kids, a lot of kids, my poor kids, they were poor kids, they, you know, they had a lot of chaos in their lives and all the rest of it. Many of them were immigrant kids, many of them were refugees from the Civil War in El Salvador uh, or Nicaragua during that period in the 80s, I'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, they had all kinds of issues going on, a lot of the Mexicans coming over the border, some legal, some, you know, undocumented and so on. Um, but the issue was, you know, some of them wouldn't come to my class. And, uh, you know, I was sort of offended by that. Um, you know, we had a 50% dropout rate in our school. And I wrote my dissertation on the school, and I wrote about the kids who dropped in rather than the kids who dropped out. But anyway, so in my classes, social studies, economics, whatever, you know, the guys, some of them wouldn't show up, you know. It's an everyday thing, and so I would... Um, I wasn't satisfied that they weren't there. I didn't want to, you know, write, you know, just write them off. So I used to go and search for them at night. And I used to go into uh, the mission area, which was a barrio, a Latino barrio, and I spoke Spanish. And, uh, and I'd find some of them hanging on the street corner. And I'd go up to them and I'd say, hey, Juan, what's going on, man? You know, what, you know why have you been? You know? And they would, it would frighten the hell out of them, that I was there looking for them. You know, it was so, you know, for them, it was like, you know, shock, right? And, oh, Mr. B, oh, Mr. B, you know, I said, don't give me Mr. B, I want to see you back there tomorrow. You know, and, you know, by, you know, what happened after a couple of weeks of doing this, finding these kids, my classes were filled. And a lot of the lads and some of the lasses uh, were involved in the street gangs uh, back in the mission at that time, 18th Street was one of them, which was an El Salvadoran gang. Anyway, the whole issue was that they were involved in the gang subculture. And uh, they said that I was showing love, the fact that I came out to bring them back, right? Which was interesting to me uh, from a, a teaching perspective, because, uh, you know, that's what I was. I got, I got into this profession to teach, not necessarily to do research. And you learn real quick especially with the younger ones, that teaching is not about uh, the communication of knowledge. That actually, t teaching I I is about the communication uh, of bodies, people, human beings, and all our uh, kind of contradictoriness and knowledge, especially with young people. If you can't connect with them, if you can't be with them, in solidarity with them, it's really v very difficult to get respect and communicate that knowledge to them. And so I learned that real quick. It's a Freirean principle. Paulo Ferreira, the great literary crusader from Brazil. And we started uh, working with the youth, and I started to have them write 
their personal histories of their lives. Because in that school, and I wrote about it, it was the first article I wrote, it was, it's called uh, uh, where you've, um, Who Do You Claim? Or where do you, what, yeah, Who Do You Claim? In uh, 1994, I think I wrote it. Um, that you, since that school had about um, 18 different gangs uh, from every different uh, race and ethnicity, Filipino gangs, African American, uh, different groups of Latinos, uh, Nicaraguan, El Salvador, Mel uh, Mexican, so on and so forth, Asian gangs. Since so many of the kids were in these gangs, I had to understand their subcultures, their real world, the way they live, the, the kind of things that they're interested in, in order to make some kind of communicative, uh, you know, begin a dialogue with them. So I got them to write about uh, their gangs and their gang membership. And the interesting thing was that the more I got on with the kids and the more that they opened up to me, uh, the more that I got in trouble uh, with the administration. And um, eventually I went back into that school and I wrote about uh, the kids who were um, abandoned and, and thrown out. They, they stayed in a, an area underneath the school that they called Pump City, or it was also called the San Quentin Track. And uh, these were all gang members. This was a year after I finished the teaching. I went back to college and I studied for a PhD and I went back to the school. And I hung out with these kids for a year underneath. And this was in the middle of the crack era. This is now uh, 1991 and 92, right in the middle of the crack era. This was the uh, period of drive-by shooting. This is when drive-by shootings first started coming up from Los Angeles. And um, uh, I wrote about the lives of these kids who were thrown out of class, who were seen as maladjusted, and started to move from, you know, my role with them, uh, my identity with them was previously as a teacher, and now it's some kind of funky researcher that wants to listen uh, to our everyday stories. And then I started listening to them and hanging out with them on the streets. And I got in the middle of drive-by shootings. I was in the middle of drive-by shootings. I was in the middle of mass gang fights, 50, 60, 70 fighting each other on over in Mission Dolores Park. I, I would stand in the middle literally with a notebook and they would fight all around me and completely leave me alone. And, um, and I wrote about this and we lost, a lot. we lost a number of kids. I lost about six kids in that year. Uh, 15 and 16 years of age, and it was a real, it was a very difficult year. The people were dying like flies uh, during that uh, period of time. But what I learned was, and this is in the early 90s, right? This is in the early years of uh, the uh, prison industrial complex, and uh, the zero tolerance hadn't come. Uh, it was being, hadn't tried, wasn't tried yet in New York City. It, we had another policy. And what was beginning to be clear to me, again, it was impossible to have any kind of meaningful intervention uh, with these youth without understanding uh, where they were coming from and what they were facing. Because the other thing they were facing, it wasn't just the gang wars where they were fighting with each other, it was usually intra-racial, it was black on black and Latino on Latino and Asian on Asian almost exclusively. But they were also... Uh, fighting AIDS. A lot of them and their family members uh, were HIV positive. And this was during the time when there were no cocktails. And people got the diagnosis of AIDS and they were dead within a few months. They had wasting disease. So their lives was one of extraordinary trauma. Extraordinary trauma. On top of which, they were coming already traumatized from the civil wars down in Central America, or they were coming from Mexico, where many of them had been tortured by the federales, the Mexican police. When I interviewed them, they, a lot of them had gone through torture by the federal police. So there was layer upon layer upon layer of trauma. And none of these kids had any kind of psychological counseling, none whatsoever. There was very few social workers. 
Why? Because what you were used to having in this country was street social workers, street workers, outreach workers, were taken off the streets in the 1970s when a famous criminologist, or after a famous criminologist, wrote a book on street gangs that said in 1971, the more we reach out to street gangs and street gang members, the more street gangs proliferate because we give them too much attention. And that was basic, that gave the rationale, and you'll find now very few, except in non-profits, street social workers. In the 60s and the early 70s, they were everywhere. And it was a radical tradition which came out of this country, which was then exported to Europe, by the way. It came out of this country because it came out of the settlement houses of Chicago and New York City when the ideas were to integrate people, especially from Eastern Europe, into society through helping them, aiding them, through policies of social inclusion. But already by the 70s, we were practicing largely policies of social exclusion. And it was becoming clear to me that these policies of social exclusion, and the police were now just about starting to get militarised in San Francisco, they'd already been very militarised in Los Angeles, and I'll talk about that in a second, I'll read a few things. <coughs> you could already see these, hard, these hardening policies of the police and these hardening policies of societies, and the panic which was developing around the young people that we did not understand. We didn't want to understand. We didn't want to recognise where they came from, from the Civil War in Central America. We couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly respond to them in any meaningful way. And it's this lack, this deficiency, not on their part culturally, but on our part from the 1980s and the 1990s, which are the roots of the problems that we have today. So now let me give you, drop some knowledge on you. <laughs> borders. The issue of borders in the US is not a new one. In fact the phenomenon, however it might be defined, goes to the very heart of the establishment of the nation itself. We are of course a settler colonial nation where the white majority gained its powers and privileges at the expense of the indigenous peoples. The process of settler colonialism is always one of the displacement of the indigenous population through depopulation and or assimilation and is always characterised by various methods of violence that can have the same characteristics as systems of human eradication such as genocide. In order to do bordering, there requires a belief system of the dominant social order in which the indigenous population is viewed as something less than human. Often referred to as primitive and or uncivilized. Since these other people are viewed as less than the settler class, it is not long before it is presumed that the space they occupy across this presumed social, physical and cultural divide is illegitimate. And as the settler class expands through integrated systems of colonialism and imperialism, it is not long before laws and policies are drawn up to devise borders that permanently separate the two entities ensuring that the socially and culturally inferior will remain behind borders that will always guarantee their inferiority and exploitability. At least until a new social order can be constructed that will erase the concept of borders as they are currently understood and maintained 
by the settler colonial system of private property and profit-based production and exchange. Hence, in the US context, it is extremely difficult to understand the erection and establishment of borders where there is internal borders that map out the states of the US or the external perimeters that divide the US from Mexico and Canada or that bizarre border that links and yet separates the island of Puerto Rico from the mainland United States. Without a critical engagement with the history of almost ceaseless violent subjugation in the name of expansionism, profit, human and environmental exploitation, all culminating in the private accumulation of capital across two centuries, most of which is now held by about 0.1% of the United States population. During the time of Occupy Wall Street, we used to talk about the 1%. That's already old hat. It's now the 0.1%, and according to Paul Krugman, it's not long before it becomes the 0.01%, such is the concentration of wealth. Of course, the history of the United States is not simply one of endless misery, expropriation and humiliation. For this system of borders has produced a surplus over time that keeps us consumed and consuming. Enough to experience a modicum of satisfaction just sufficient to continue earnestly striving for that elusive American dream. Thus whether we are talking about the borders following the Indian Removal Act of 1830 leading to the Trail of Tears and the forced removal of the Cherokee, the Muscogee, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Ponca, the Ho-Chunk and the Winnebago nations or the borders that grew out of transatlantic slavery both in the agricultural south or the industrializing north, or the Mexican-US border about which Mr. Trump made his successful bid for the presidency, and across which 500,000 Mexicans were sent in 1951 during Operation Wetback, or the east and west coast borders from which hundreds, perhaps thousands of Chinese were banished, after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. They all resulted from systemic acts and processes of violent subjugation. What is crucial to remember is that all of these acts, with a little a, were also acts, with a big A. In other words, they became codified policies that became articles of law and provided a legal language to produce and reproduce processes of othering. This is terribly important. If you look at current deportation laws, and I'll talk a bit about this later, uh, that came about around 1996 and then were advanced, enhanced in 2001 under the Patriot Act, the language is exactly the same as all the languages that were used in these acts of, sub of violent expulsion uh, that I just talked about. The runaway slave acts, the same language used then is used in the deportation laws today. The Chinese Exclusion Act, Operation Wetback that, re that, re that reversed the policy of the Procero program. All the language is exactly the same. And if you want to uh, look up further on that, the legal scholar Dan Canstrom from Boston College has written a book called Deportation Nation. And it was the first book to look at the long history of the United States, of not simply an immigration nation, but we have always been a deportation nation. As a result, borders, as I conceive them, 
in my line of work, which focuses on symbolic and substantive lines of demarcation, across which people are either included or excluded, and sometimes both at the same time, are more than legal entities or fixed agreements signed under duress by various unequal parties. Rather, borders are congealed histories of blood, sweat, and tears. Borders bleed. They are spaces of resistant memories and practices, narratives of sociocultural resistance, languages that refuse to be unspoken, places at the side of the road, and markers of generations past whose ghosts still appear in our dreams and become present as the border itself is what loses its legitimacy rather than the people who are bordered. Let me see here. Do you go, how do I go to the next slide? Oh, there. Sorry. Okay. So real quick, this is, this is what it looked like <laughs> before the Europeans came, the tribal nations of the United States. I think that's really, if you have a chance to put something like that on your wall, you should, just to remind yourself whose land we're on. Gangs. Gangs. Once we understand what borders are and what they are not, then we can begin to understand the emergence of gangs. For such groups necessarily spring from the violent acts of bordering. In societies where there are few borders, especially borders of race, ethnicity and class, there are generally few gangs. Since gangs always develop out of processes of social exclusion, i.e. borders, some youth may respond by developing their own subcultures within which they create diverse forms of socio-cultural meaning including systems of communication, styles of dress, rituals of assembly, and norms of formal adherence. According to Cohen, from the 1970s Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, that's in the UK, such groups are established by youth to magically solve problems of marginality. What some youth cannot achieve in terms of social or economic power, they can experience in terms of cultural power and sometimes other forms of social power which may involve them mimicking the dominant social order's practice of bordering by imposing their own borders within their own bordered territory. In some of the self-destructive practices of gangs, for example, in, international, in intergenerational gang wars, the violence that ensues is a form of fratricide that grows out of the long-term bordered subjugation of a subpopulation living with the norm of denied resources, limited opportunities, and scant access to real, not imaginary, political power. Both the histories of gang violence in Los Angeles and Chicago are excellent examples of this process. See, if you like, the documentary Bastards of the Party. In the US, which has long had the most stringent forms of internal bordering, i.e. segregation, of any Western nation, it is logical that it would have some of the most developed intergenerational gang subcultures of anywhere in the world. Hence today we see some gangs, for example the White Fence Gang of Los Angeles, which is more 
than four generations old, i.e. over 100 years. Or the Latin kings and conservative vice lords of Chicago, which are between two and three generations of duration. And a study of what is important to remember is that it is only in more recent times that the gang has been almost completely pathologized and rendered as an entity which is, per se, criminal and dangerous. This came about more or less from the reaction to gangs in Los Angeles during the mid to late 1970s, something I just sort of referred to. When the LAPD started to define the gang as a form of organized violence and special units called CRASH, Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums, were set up with the goal of eradicating the gang, like it was a cancer from the body of the community. This removed all sociological or criminological thinking about the gang and inspired what the criminologist Hallsworth calls gang talk. A self-perpetuating form of policing discourse that serves to reproduce narratives of war and combat while studiously avoiding any serious discussion of the roots of the transgressive behaviour or the conditions under which these groups were producing forms of behaviour uh, and being reproduced themselves. This anti-gang discourse quickly became both hegemonic and global. For gang policing throughout the United States was elevated by moral crusades and panics like the war on drugs started in 1980, i.e. just after the 1970 uh, establishment of crash by President Ray Gunn. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> Along with various allied crusades against the illegal immigrant. Of course, nobody is illegal. How can a body be illegal? Joke. By the end of the 1980s, we were well into the mass incarceration epoch and what is often referred to now as a system of new Jim Crow. This came about through a convergence of moral panics as we entered an era of continuous rather than episodic moral panics. It is this epoch of continuous moral panics which is the hallmark of the Trump administration and bears within it the massive crisis of legitimacy through which we are now passing today. Now, I know I'm looking at time here and we can sort of have to move on to deportation. So, what's happened is that during this whole time, I've been working with some of these gangs. I started working with 18th Street back in the early 90s and I moved on to the Latin Kings and Yetas and other groups in uh, around 1996. And I'm still working with them. Um, only now I work with them in Europe, uh, in Spain and Italy, and more recently in uh, Ecuador. Um, it's the longest, and someone please look it up and contradict me, uh, it's the longest gang study ever in the United States. I just realized that today on my way here. 22 years to work with the same group for 22 no, there's no other criminologist, socialist I know that's done that. And I'm still writing about them. The interesting thing is when I talked about the violence, the interesting thing was, and I'll get on to deportation in a second, the interesting thing was that when we did the study of the Latin Kings, I'd been working with groups that were killing each other very often, but I refused to pathologize them when I wrote about them. I tried to try to figure out what they were coming from and so on and so forth. When we started working with the Latin Kings in 96, they were, at that point, seen as the most dangerous gang in the United States. Their leader, founder, a guy called King Blood, Luis Felipe, uh, in 97, uh, received uh, like 250 years uh, incarceration. 
But what was interesting about his sentence wasn't just the length, because they'd also given other people long terms. But 45 years was to be spent in solitary confinement. His first 45 years in prison, right? That was the most severe prison sentence of any federal inmate since World War II, right? Other than being, uh, you know, hung. <laughs> so, but the group itself was going through a, part, a period of enormous transition. And I spent from 96 to 2001 with them, and there wasn't a single homicide in the group or between the group and any other group in New York City. Giuliani declared war on them uh, in 1998 in a raid called Operation Crown and used something like 1,000 police officers to raid their home uh, across New York City. It was the largest police raid since 1919 Palmer raids, which were the raid against the Communist Party in New York City. And he was raiding a group that couldn't be whose members, very few of his members, were being brought into the courts after two or three years of uh, reforming. So it was a fantastic experiment that even when the gang doesn't do what you said it's doing, it doesn't matter because the politics, right? of repression, the politics of eradication, have nothing to do with crime. It has to do with the politics of getting votes and doing something on another level in society, shifting resources by using the gang as a scapegoat. All these years later, I'm working with this group now that has spread through Latin America, and I've been working with them for five years in Ecuador. There's about 4,000 members in Ecuador. Some of them started through deportation. The gang, Ecuador, is the only country in the world since 2007 that legalized its street gangs. It legalized the Latin kings, the nietas, and the masters of the street. They have about 12,000 members between them. Over 10 years, from 2007 to 2017. Why? Because the president who came to power in 2017 came to power on a manifesto called the Citizens' Revolution, which meant that he was about empowering people to find their voice, to become involved in society, mass social inclusion, including the gangs, and was convinced only a policy of social inclusion would be the way forward to achieve bona fide social control. Why was such a policy so important? Why? Because he was boarded by two of the largest drug producing nations in the world. Peru on one side, Colombia on the other side. And he was terrified that the cartels would move into Ecuador. And the first thing that the cartels come when they come in is they recruit the young guys from the street and bring them into the organization. And he very rationally said, we are not going to go the route of the United States and criminalize these kids because it will only reproduce the power of the cartels because they will soon take over the prisons and sexual sex. Today, 2018, our study finished little, about three or four months ago, the rate of homicide in Ecuador is the fastest drop in homicide in the world. Try to find that on Google. Which country has the fastest drop in homicide? Ecuador. Ten years after policy of legalization of the street gangs. The complete opposite policy to the United States, which was social exclusion. Deportation. Quickly. Five, right, ten minutes. The mothers, what's this got to do with the mother self torture in Long Island or the mother self torture in New Jersey or God knows where else? Wherever they're coming from, says Mr. Trump, they're coming to get us. These brown swarthy hordes are coming to rape our women, take away our jobs, bring the drug cartels here. These heartless, conscienceless people, they are the other. They are from here. And I repeat, they are from here. Mother Salvatore and 18th Street came from the Pico Union District of downtown LA. 
And they came because they were fleeing the civil war in the 1980s up until 1992, which was almost exclusively funded by the United States government. They were kids, highly traumatized, came with their mums, some with their dads, got over the border, claimed asylum that so many people are now, or would wish to, and grew up in poverty and formed their own subcultures. But they weren't gangs. They were into heavy metal. And they grew their, head, their hair long. And they did their thing. It made sense to them. But the gangs in the areas that surrounded them, the Chicano gangs, the Mexican-American gangs of long standing, didn't like them coming into their area and called them wetbacks, whether they were from Mexico or from Central America, and started challenging them for space, for attention, for power on the street or whatever. The difference was these kids had been through war. They came out of the killing fields of Central America. So they fought back. And they wanted to be meaner and harder and more violent than the kids that put them down. That's the origins of MS-13 and that's the origins of 18th Street. If you want to read it, read a book by Tom Ward or go on and uh, see a, uh, a very good documentary called Fruits of War. It was made about five or six years ago. But then what happened? I'm working with these guys in early 1991, 92. I'm interviewing them uh, in San Francisco. They're, yeah, they're involved in uh, drive-by shootings and whatever. They're, some of them were involved in the crack trade and so on and so forth. But they weren't getting deported. And then comes 1996. Clinton signs the most draconian deportation immigration act basically, of uh, the 20th century. He signed this tome, it's about 300 pages, 280 pages thick. They reckon only one person read the act before it was signed by the members of Congress. He signed it, he said it was the worst act he ever signed. He should have vetoed it, but he thought it would change in time, and it wouldn't be that bad. Why is that act so bad? One, there is virtually no relief possible because you have connections, because you have family, because you've been a good guy in the past. The only relief there is is if you can prove that you're going to be killed or tortured when you return to your homeland if you're a guy or if you're going to be killed by your partner if you're a woman under the Conventions against uh, Women's Against Violence. One is a Convention Against Torture and one is the war against uh, the Violence Against Women's Act that the United States is a co-signature of. So there is no relief like there was before. Two, it's retroactive. It doesn't matter if you did time 10 years ago, two or three years. It doesn't matter if you did community service four or five years ago, or you put, was in probation. Whatever you did in the past, makes you now a deportable alien and if you've done a 12 month sentence if you've got an aggravated felony then you go into expedited removal proceedings and there's very little you can do about it. In 96 this act is passed the INS was called ICE was then the INS then in Immigration Naturalization Service they went to town they went to town uh, under different agencies to deport the gang member, deport the deportable alien, deport the terrorist. By this time, Los Angeles has passed uh, the Street Terrorism Act. They went from gang membership to street terrorism, from street hoodlum to terrorism. You are now a terrorist. And in fact, uh, when, uh, what's his name, uh, who's the one who went over to LAPD from uh, NYPD? Bratton. 
when he went from uh, he went into private practice, and then he went over to LAP, LAPD as their uh, commissioner, whatever you call it over there. The first week he was there, he held a press conference and he said, we are not threatened by the terrorists such as ISIS or whoever blew up uh, hit the uh, World Trade Center. The, what the, ter the terrorists that we're most concerned with are the gang members. They're the terrorists. So under the new 96 Act and also under the Patriot Act, we rounded them up in the tens of thousands. And you're deportable, it doesn't matter if you're legal or illegal, if you're documented or undocumented, you are deportable. I am an LPR, a legal permanent resident. I am also a deportable alien. It doesn't matter that I've been here over 35 years. So they rounded them up, detention camps all across California sprung up, and they sent these guys back to Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. That are just coming out of the Civil War. The countries are bankrupt. They really had no functioning criminal justice system. The prisons were already filled. And these guys go back there, and some of the women, with the tattoos on their faces or on their arms, that was all part of their subculture, and they're obviously not wanted. And they're feared. And El Salvador had a history of death squads. They started up at the end of the 80s, when they were taking out uh, the commies and the revolutionaries. And they'd been disbanded. But now they started up again. And they took on the new other that was coming into their country. They started whacking these guys as they got off the plane before they could even get into San Salvador. The, San, the El Salvador uh, government looked to the United States for help, for strategic help, for advice, and the United States gave it. And they said, do what we do, lock them up. Zero tolerance, mano dura, and super mano dura. So they banned the gangs. They're illegal now in El Salvador. And one of the things you'll learn in criminology is very important. It's called deviance amplification. That the more you repress a behavior, the more you attempt to eradicate a, social, a, so, a certain social behavior, such as drug use, the more it will multiply. Because you're not getting to the roots of the behavior itself. Just like we weren't getting to the roots of the behavior of the gangs in the 1980s. And that's exactly where we are now. Why are the kids in LA, uh, in Long Island? Because after being deported back to El Salvador, where there's now probably about 28, 30,000 Mother Salvador, which has grown from about two or 3,000 originally. Many of them uh, either have fled El Salvador because it is now the highest homicide rate in the world. It's about 105 per 100,000. Ecuador is five per 100,000. So you're either fleeing the highest homicide rate in the world. If you're in the gang, you may be fleeing the gang to get up to this country. But you're fleeing. And at a certain point, when you flee and you get into this country, where do you go? You go where there's an ethnic enclave. You go where there's people like you. And they moved, instead of from California, where the people were hot on their towel, they moved over to here, to Long Island, where they were hired as gardeners and dishwashers and part of that whole labouring class in the segmented economy. That's where they came from, and that's why they're here. What we actually have produced, and this is the takeaway, is a blowback effect. The very thing that we supposedly have tried to eradicate in the country we have now reproduced globally. We have now reproduced globally. And that's the most terrifying thing which is going on right now. And we can't talk about it. Trump comes in. A man without any policies. 
who is clearly pathological and sociopathic and narcissistic. But he has very good advisors. And they know that moral panics work. They know that moral panics work when people feel insecure, unsure of their identity, unsure of their future, because they've lived with 25 years of neoliberalism. They live in an environment where they don't know if they're going to have a job next week or the week after. Look at General Motors at the moment. They don't know even if they're trained for a job, they don't know if that skill they're trained for will exist in six months of a year's time because of technological innovation. If they have space and a roof over their heads, they don't know how long they'll keep it because they're facing gentrification and the explosion of structural violence through the real estate industry. And they don't know if they can pay for their children's health or their own health because they don't know if they're going to have in life, life, uh, health insurance for much longer. And we're not even talking about the cost of education. So of course people are insecure. Of course people are nervous about their present everyday conditions. And the guy on the big white horse comes in and says, I'm going to save you. And he appeals to their essentialism. He appeals to their nativism. Just like they've done in the past. Just like they did after the Civil War. Just like they did in the 1920s and the 1930s. Just like they did during the era of McCarthyism. It's an old game. But it works in the short term. The other point I want to make is that you cannot for long maintain any legitimacy by simply ruling through fear, by simply ruling through ceaseless moral, moral panics. So you must enter now, Mr. Trump, President Trump, enters now a deep crisis of legitimacy. And it was most exemplified in one extraordinary event was when the CNN journalist Jim Acosta stood up to him in front of the world and said, answer the question on the caravan. Answer, are they a threat? And cetera, et cetera. And he said, I don't want to talk to you. He said, no, answer that. Have you ever seen that before in American history? No, you haven't. And it's because there is, the emperor has no clothes, essentially. And that's the period we're in now. It doesn't matter how many moral panics you now uh, basically start upon. Uh, you know, you begin and you get the media involved. Fox News, of course, follows him everywhere. But there is no there there. The caravan and the 500 that broke apart the other day, of course they broke apart. That's what we did. That's what we wanted them to do. They were appealing for asylum and they're keeping them there. You used to be able to appeal, appeal for asylum and the ICE and the DHS were taking 200 and 250 applications a day. They deliberately refuse to take any more applications. They reduced it to about 40 or 50 today. So these are men and women that have been on the road for three or four months with their children and they're getting pushed back into the, the line, pushed back for weeks. Of course, what do you think they're going to do after a certain point in time? They're going to break and become so-called irrational, which is exactly what ICE wanted them to do. And then we could be all over the news, look at the hordes coming across our borders. This is a situation we're in now. It's a very, very, very dangerous situation. Thanks for listening to me. Okay, great. Um, so we have uh, something like uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes uh, for discussion, for questions. Uh, people have anything to share. Uh, please put your hands up. We're going to try something new. We have a uh, a sort of a mobile uh, mic. So I'm going to try to like throw this to you mm -hmm. uh, and you will catch it, ask your question, um, uh, maybe say uh, your major so we can kind of know who's in the room. Um, so who wants to, who wants to start? Okay, great. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you got it. Yeah, yeah. 
how did you go about asking the gang members, and who did you ask um, to like review them or like journalize about them? <coughs> That's a good story. So uh, back in uh, '96, uh, I'd spent a year in the most three most violent schools in New York. Uh, I was on the gang task force um, under the pres uh, the, tr the chancellor then was called Rudy Crew, and I was the only social scientist on the gang task force. And I used to hang out in these schools: one in the Bronx, one in Brooklyn, and one in Manhattan. And uh, and I was supposed to sort of talk about why there were uh, all these gangs in the schools. Well, there weren't, actually. I mean, there were, but it wasn't, that wasn't really the issue. Uh, the issue was uh, uh, funding crisis, uh, high rates of turnover among teachers, all kinds of other issues. The gang you know, wasn't really the big issue after one year, but the task force didn't, didn't want to hear that. They wanted me to say, no, gangs is a problem, because they could get more money from the feds if gangs were the problem. And I said, well, that's not the issue. The issue is these other... Anyway, they didn't want to hear it. So, you know, they just say, shut up, you know. And during that time, I was uh, working with some Latin kings in a class uh, in um, uh, a class in Manhattan somewhere. And I wanted to talk to them, but I didn't know how to approach them. Uh, you know, it's very... You have to be very... You know, you have to get trust, right? So literally around that time, I'm in another meeting at John Jay, and this guy comes up to me after, and he said, I heard you want to you want to talk to uh, some gang members? I said, yeah. I've never met this guy before. And he said, why? He said, why don't you come along Saturday? He said, come along. I said, wait, he said, come along to my church. And he didn't have like, you know, he had a suit on, right? And I said, uh, what are you talking about church? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an Episcopalian priest, he says. Said, really? He said, yeah, I, and a psychologist. Oh, all right, whatever. So that Saturday came, and I went up to uh, St. Mary's Church on 126th Street in Harlem. And uh, I write about this in the Land Kings book. And I got off the train. It was number one, 125th. And as I'm sitting on the train, I'm coming in up from Upper West Side where I was living. And all these guys started getting on and they're all wearing black and yellow. And, um, and the train fills up with all these guys. It was like going to, uh, you know, I'm a soccer, you know, soccer fan. It's like going to a soccer match. They're all wearing the colours, you know. I thought, wow, hello, this is interesting. So we all got off the train and there were like loads. There were like, 50 of these guys and some women all coming off with me. We go down the thing and then we walk around and there, on, off 126th Street, you can see it today, is the church. It's this old church, holds about 800 people. And the, right opposite is Harlem Precinct Police Station. <laughs> right opposite. And as we're walking in, there's all these guys all in their colours and all the cops are standing outside the precinct. And, there, and it's like the blue uniform and the black and yellow uniforms, right? It was like this amazing vista of the two. So I go into the front and the guy pats me down. He says, you know, he asked me if you pack in. I said, yeah, I've got a pen. And uh, <laughs> I'm very weaponized. And uh, he said, well, you just go, you know, it was all that. So you go down there and you'll see the people. So I walked around to the side of the church and there's this guy, Luis Barrios, right? He's a, he's a Puerto Rican, uh, sort of very famous uh, uh, radical leader in the Puerto Rican community in New York. And I go and he, he, into, he says, oh, Dave, great you're here. And he brings me into this church and the place is filled. It's absolutely filled to the seven, eight hundred people. Easy, easy, easy. And children running around and, oh, kids everywhere and this and that and the other. So, and then they've got these two pews here for guests. And there's like me and there's some guy from Telemundo and there's someone else and a woman from the Rape Crisis Centre and some dude from the Construction Workers Union, the Carpenters. Oh, it's amazing, right? And all the rest is gang members. Well, we did about seven hours in there of a meeting. Seven hours. That was my first meeting. Now, I didn't realize they all last seven hours. They spend three hours just taking registration. And registration is you go around and they call out your names, the Brooklyn tribe, and they'll shout their names up. I'm all that, I'm all that, And they'll shout out their name, you know, King Sinner, King Chino. And, they go, oh, boy. and everybody's got to shout their name. And I thought, this is amazing. I'd been with guys on the West Coast, the Mudders and the 18th Street, and I've, I've been with Crips and Bloods in Los Angeles. We'd never seen anything like that. Nothing like it. And then for seven hours? And then we go through like three hours of monologues? An hour of reading letters from prison? 
half an hour of poetry? I mean, give me a break. What, you know, what? And then we have like, you know, you know, whoever, other people, like people like me would get up and like make some like five, you know, some remarks about, you know, well done, go boys and all that, you know. After this, I walked to the back of the church and the leader at that time, the guy called King Tong, who, this is in 1996, and I still work with him in DC. Now, 2018. I still work with him 22 years later. He's got a non-profit in DC. We do this big uh, program in DC called the Credible Messenger Initiative. And I'll talk about it in, in something else. He comes up to me, he says, Brother, what do you want to do? And he likes a famous gang leader. I'm going, Jesus, you know, what am I going to say? You know, it's me, I've got it's stupid, you know, I've got my little jacket on, whatever. It'll be a notebook in my hand, you know. I said, oh, Tony said, I, I said, you know, I said, this is amazing. Because I was blown away, I was really sort of, couldn't believe it, you know. I said, I, I don't know, man, I, I, I want to write your history. He looks at me and he goes, okay, on two provisions, he goes. I said, what's that? Number one. You tell the truth. I said, all right. Number two, you don't go to the media. And you don't make money out of us. I said, you got it, man. You got it. And that was it. And that was in 96, September, October 96. And I stayed with them, and I'm still with them, 22 years later. And it was about trust. It was about, I had no history, you know. I'd never sort of given media things, you know, just sensationalised like some of my colleagues had done at that time. I was a friend of Luis Barrios, he was like close to them, they were meeting in his church, all these sorts of things. I was checked out, they checked out who I was before I came. And then over time, uh, you know, we stayed with them for three or four years. And I had a research team, it was about five of us, and I had one of my guys was a documented immigrant from Mexico who had followed me all the way from Berkeley. And uh, he got a scholarship to Albany, SUNY Albany. And he spent, he spent three years on the street with them, especially in Washington Heights and East New York. And that was it. And, you know, whatever. What other questions? Shows like the repetitive, habitual, like exclusion cycles we've been through historically. Do you think is it ever going to change, or if it's going to keep repeating itself? And what measures could be taken to make a difference? Yeah, I I, th I think that uh, look, uh, you know, we have to learn, right? I mean, isn't that isn't that what kind of separates us from other species. <laughs> we learn. <laughs> Some of us, you know, we don't deny our external world. We kind of think science is a good idea sometimes and climate is changing and human beings can change and adapt, right? I mean, you, you know, you're Americans. You, you, you come from a, a land of pragmatism. And that's the base, that's your main philosophy is pragmatism, it comes out of this country. And, uh, but you've got to learn. You have to be honest. And we're not honest. We're not honest with ourselves. We, we you know, we have our criminal just, justice policy is run by uh, ideologues and, and not uh, based on, on uh, practice, you know, real practice and experience. So, uh, and you've got to listen to the kids. We don't listen to the kids. We shout, you know, we tell the kids, we treat the kids, you know, we put them in treatment. Or, or we've already decided who they are before, you know, and what they've done before, before anything. We don't listen. And, you know, we're not, we're not prepared to learn. Learning is dangerous. It's become dangerous in this country. Not real learning. You know, but so we have to, we have to imagine a different world, right? I mean, as your, this is your, this is your, this is, you are it. I'm telling you. I told my students the other day. I must have frightened the hell out of them. I, I said, you're it, guys. It's your generation. It's not mine. I've had it, man. I've been there. 
I mean, I'll be with you, you know, I'll do whatever I can, but you, you're the ones, it's your world, it's, it's your children, it's for your, you know, you lot. You've got to get out of it, you've got all this knowledge you keep dropping, you know, all these degrees, what are you going to do with it? What career do you think you're going to get? Seriously? In this world? It's what you make it, and you've got to, and, and it's, it's up to us, but we've got to throw the, the bums out, you know? Uh, on every level, I mean, ju not just the, the politicians, but these guys that are getting these jobs, you know, uh, and carrying out, but there's a lot of banality of evil going on. There's a lot of guys going out routine, doing brutal things to our children, because they're getting a pay packet and a pension. You know, and we've got to stop that, and and we can. So you know, I look. I didn't think when I did all this in '96. I when they came into when they locked up, they locked up Tone. He did 12 years. He got fitted up, and he got he did four or five years in a solitary confinement. He got busted on a drug charge, hundred dollar hundred dollar dope charge, and he got 12 years. Right? They sent him. The first place they sent him to was Leavenworth which is the first maximum security prison in the United States. And they put him in the dog pound. He was the lowest class offender. The dog pound is this terrible place underneath the prison. They locked him up there for four years. It would send you nuts. It would send me nuts after four minutes. Why? Because he was King Tom. Why are you frightened of him? Why? Right? Because in his own way, he imagined a different society, even though it was with these kings. He had transformed these kings. I'm not saying oh, all this heroism, but why would society be frightened of someone like that? Wouldn't a rational society would say, oh man, you've got some talent there. You know how to talk to these dudes. You can organise. They listen to you. Come over here, man. We'll give you some resources. But we're not a rational society. We are a completely irrational society. Right? We have to get through our heads. We keep thinking that people, we tell the truth and people will listen and people will change. No, they will not. They won't change until power changes. And we have to change the power structure. And that's a whole work right there. I mean, maybe we started here, you know, I'm going on being very political, but it is political. But when I, all I was going to say was, at the end of my thing, and I finished in 2001, and this guy comes in to me from the Kings, and I'm sitting in my office, and I'm very depressed. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, I just got another letter from Tone, he's got a big beard, he looks like Jesus Christ, he's depressed, he says he wants to kill himself, oh my God, you know, all this, and I'm right in the end of the book. And this guy says to me, I know Dave, I know Dave, he says, we're, we're not going to call ourselves the kings anymore. You know, we, we've, we've learned our lesson. You know, we came out, we got, we got our heads chopped off. This is what happens to us. No, we're going to be a secret society. We're going to be called the Brown Force. Oh, whatever. That's that. End of the story, right? 2002, I go to the Dominican Republic. I lived there for a year. And I was the first to write about the deportation crisis. Right? in the United States. I did the first conferences there and the first conference in, you know, whatever. While I was there, I get this email from Spain, from Barcelona. And his social worker says, oh, Dave, you know, I've read your stuff, blah, 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 blah. We've got these guys here. They call themselves the Latin Kings. I said, in Barcelona? He said, yeah, Barcelona. We've never had this group. Can you tell us what to do with them? They seem really serious. I said, they are really serious. I says, but okay, and I just happened to be going to Barcelona, I just happened to be going to Barcelona a week later and to give a talk at some other university there. Right? And I sat, and I went down at Umbras, and we had a, a meeting with about 50 social workers. And at the end of it, they said, Dave, what do we do? I said, you know what you do? You don't do what the Americans do. You do anything but. You cannot go that route of gang repression. It will simply amplify exponentially the problem you have. And they didn't. And they went to the city council called the Generalitat, and they said, give us some money, and we'll work with these kids as social workers, like the Americans used to do in the 50s and 60s. And they did. And there was some having, they were having some problems between the Nietas and the kings in Barcelona. 
and they worked with them. And they brought them together and the Generali Tut passed a law in 2007 recognising them as cultural associations of immigrants. And within a year there was almost no violence between these guys. And then the city of Genoa in Italy did the same. It was an amazing thing. I'm going, Jesus Christ. Right? I'm, I'm in, I started in, now I'm here. And then I get a call from Quito, Ecuador. And I go there. And there's thousands. And the government says, the government, this man, this big president, there's a pic, I can't show you this picture. There's a picture, I have this amazing picture of all the kings in the presidential palace. And the president of Korea is throwing a crown. As he gives it, as he's doing a shake. And they turn into the corporation of the Latin kings and queens. I've got, I can't have time, I've got this amazing five minute Vimeo that we just did, we're making a documentary down there, it's incredible. I don't know if we have time to do it, right? Do you want me to show it? Yeah. Do we have to? No, we don't, okay. So anyway, that, all I'm saying, that is a total counterintuitive to what I, and I'm going, wow, right? And now, now, Telemundo is just down there now in Ecuador, they're doing now a documentary to be sent around the globe on what, what I've just told you. The BBC just did a huge report on what I just told you. All this stuff is coming out. So look, I don't know where it's going to go. You don't know where it's going to go. But you've got to do the righteous thing. Hi, I'm Brenda. I'm a nursing major. I'm a business yeah. manager. Um, I have a question for you. So you're saying basically that since we're repressing gang members, we should legalize that so we can have less homicide rate? Well, I'm saying under, look, it depends. Look, each society has its own way of dealing with the group or these groups humanistically, right? We have, you know, our, the way we've, the way we're dealing with the situation Oh you, oh, you had more? Okay, yeah. So, there are some gang members, so whether we agree, or not, agree with it or yeah, not, the Ku Klux Klan or yeah. white supremacists, they're well, a gang. I'm not even going into that. Yeah, but they're a gang. So, if we start to let gang members come out and show what they have to do in their stories and stuff, don't you think it can cause a problem within the country since we're already on a very tight... So, I haven't got into like the Klan and the white supremacist group. That's, that's, another, that's a different thing. Right? And there's, uh, there's other ways of dealing with them. I, I, we don't have time to get into that. They, there's, what, there's things they're doing in uh, actually Northern Europe. Uh, they do this thing called Project Exit, where they work, where they work specifically with neo-fascist groups, you know, because they've been causing havoc there too, um, and you know, get them out of the group, and, have, and a number of them have been very, very successful. But you know, the white supremacist thing, you know, clearly is that we've, we have a, a president which is opening the sluice gates. Right? to white supremacy. I mean, you know, he, he's an enabler, right? I mean, you have to set <laughs> standards, right? You have to model behavior, right? You know, it's, it's a fantastic criminological fact, right? When you get, um, you know, uh, crimes that go peak and trough, right? What we find is over a century or so that one of the biggest predictors of crime increases among juveniles is crime increases among the adult population. And you'll see a parallel thing. So you'll see as the adult population gets in more and more involved, you know, in real crime, I'm not talking about just getting picked up for misdemeanors, and about, there's a five-year lag, and then the, the youth, and, it, and it's a parallel kind of curve, and it goes down and it drops down. What's that about? It's about the modeling effect, right? It's about how we socialize our kids. If the adults, right, are showing the youth terrible examples of how to get along through, you know, through racism or ethnicism or, uh, you know, hypermasculinity and machismo and all these sorts of things. If that's how you teach your kids, you, what do you think your kids are going to do? And the gangs only reflect that. The gangs aren't an independent variable. What gangs are always are symptoms of issues deep in the society. They're like a barometer. It's like the canary in the mine. So in, what do you want to do? Do you want to get rid of gangs in a poor area? You put investment in that goddamn area. 
You make sure those schools are good. You make sure there's employment for those kids when they grow up. You make sure the mums and dads are not living in absolute poverty. You make sure they've got health care. You make sure they've got all these things. Just like you would do for middle class people. That's what you do. Do you think middle class people leave, leave their kids to chance? No, they put them in private education. Why? Why should they be any different? Right? So that's really important. So, you know, you have to guarantee, so you have to have economic rights as well as political rights. We don't even have many political rights left, do we? Okay, so with that, let's all uh, thank uh, Dr. Okay.